This is the problem we started talking about last class, and this is the problem Dijkstra introduced in this paper, and there have been lots and lots of different solutions to. So we have some set of independent processes or independent threads, but they have some shared memory they can use to communicate, and no other ways to communicate. What we want is to figure out some way to guarantee this safety property. So this is our most important property, the mutual exclusion property that says only one of them can be in the critical section. So if thread X is in the critical section, no other thread can be in that section. So that's the safety property. We also have a liveness property that says they all must eventually make progress, and every thread must get some chance to enter its critical section. So those are the two key properties. The other ones are things that make it non-trivial to solve. So the requirements for the solution, and this I'm stating this the same way that we did in class last time. Dijkstra stated a little differently. We'll see at least one of the solutions a team came up with last class was a good solution, interpreting this the way I stated it, rather than what Dijkstra really meant. The fact that they're trivial solutions means it's not actually interpreting what the problem is in the right way. Because a lot of the point of looking at this last class was to realize that the trivial solution to this don't work. This seems like a pretty simple problem, but it turns out to be quite difficult to solve. This is the clever cheating solution. I would say the solution that actually satisfies the way I worded it that one of the teams came up with last class, which is we're going to use the shared memory to have some variable that we'll call turn. And initially, turn is going to be 1. The value of turn tells you which thread gets a chance to run. These threads have numbers, thread 1. We have that variable within the thread code that it knows what its identity is. So if we had this turn variable, then we could make our loop. We're just going to check if it's our turn. If the value of turn is i, that means it's our turn, because i is the identity of this processor. And then we're going to do our critical section. And when we're done with it, we're going to add 1 to turn to say that it's the next processor's turn to go. And I should probably have a mod n in here. So it eventually cycles back. Since Dijkstra numbered them from 1 to n instead of 0 to n minus 1, that mod n is not quite correct, but hopefully you get the intent of it. This seems like a really trivial solution. If this was the actual problem, there wouldn't be 40 papers trying to solve this, and Lampart wouldn't have got a Turing Award partly for coming up with a better solution to this. So why do we not like this solution? So first, does it satisfy the safety property? Does this provide mutual exclusion? Is there a way to argue that we know it's never the case that more than one process is running in the critical section. Value i. How does it, oh, so the assumption is you know your own value i, and that they start with unique values counting the processes. So that is a, an assumption that Dijkstra had that's not really stated here. Each of the processes is initialized with some local variable i that identifies its number. So without that, this solution definitely wouldn't work. All the solutions we're going to look at have that assumption. There's some local variable that you know what your thread number is. And those can be set up in such a way that we have threads 1 through n. So that's certainly an important assumption to making this correct, is knowing all the thread numbers are unique and that they are all sequential, giving us numbers from 1 to n. So how do we know that we can't have more than one thread running in the critical section at the same time? That's the real safety property we need here. The thing we're worried about would be, here's thread 1, here's thread 2. Thread 1 would do, it would be OK, and it would enter critical section. And then thread 2 would also do this and enter its critical section. Thread 1 is going to see turn equals 1, thread 2 is going to see turn equals 2, and they both enter the critical section at the same time. Let's suppose we did this here. So let's suppose we did the turn equals turn plus 1 before the critical section instead of after it. If we did it like that, do we still have mutual exclusion? Good. Right. So there's a way to interleave these events. If we, if we ordered it like this, we could interleave these events. So if we did this, we did this, we did this, then they could both be in the critical section at the same time. That's the property we're not supposed to have. But the way the code is, that's not the case. We don't do the turn equals turn plus 1 until after the critical section. So we know that this is going to be step 2, and this is going to be step 3 for thread 1. That means that thread 2 can do the test for turn 
if thread2 do, does the test return anywhere in this execution part, it's going to be false, which means it does not enter the critical section. It goes back to the loop and is waiting. So it wouldn't enter the critical section if thread1 has not finished it. Because the only way that this term value gets up to 2 is when thread1 has finished its critical section. And then thread1 won't enter it again because the term value doesn't equal 1 until thread3 is finished and sets it back to 1. This provides mutual exclusion. Does it provide liveness? Remember how the liveness property was stated. Each of the threads must eventually be able to enter its critical section. Does this provide that? Are there any scenarios you can think of where it would not provide liveness? Is there anything that could happen that would prevent thread 2 from entering its critical section? OK, good. Yeah, so thread 1, if thread 1 does not finish, so if thread 1 gets stuck here, maybe it crashes in some way that never gets to the turn equals i plus 1 statement. Maybe it goes in an infinite loop. Something happens that thread 1 gets stuck in its critical section. Then thread 2 is never going to get to run. The way the problem was stated, there's an assumption that they all eventually make progress. So you can't make any assumptions about the speed, but there is an assumption that none of them get stuck in the critical section. And all the solutions we'll look at have this property that if one gets stuck in the critical section, liveness is, is no longer guaranteed. So that is definitely a property that would be important for any practical system where you do have threads that might get stuck in their critical section to have some way to recover from that. None of these solutions will do that. So according to Dijkstra's requirement, it does satisfy this so long as no thread gets stuck. And actually, in this case, it's an even stronger property. It can't get stuck at all because thread 1 has to finish its non-critical section first as well as the critical section before the next thread gets its turn. So this is a bit of a stronger property than the other solutions have. So why do we not like the solution? This seems like it satisfies the two requirements. What's not so good about this solution? OK, yeah, so the, the way the code is written, it's a little buggy. So we need something if turn is greater than it should go back to 1. So without that, we would only get one turn each, and then it would be stuck. So we do need something to, to make it wrap around correctly. What else do we not like about it? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so the problem this has, which in the way Dijkstra stated the problem was clearly unsatisfactory, but not so clear from the way I stated it, this basically requires that the threads execute in a particular order. T1 is always going to finish first, and then T2 is going to run, then T3, then T1. The way this is written, the turns are in this predefined order. We're basically sequentializing the code. We're taking away any opportunities for cur currency there might be and requiring things to execute in this particular order. And the way Dijkstra stated the problem, he said that we can't introduce some static priority, which is stating that we don't want a solution like this. A solution that forces things to execute in a particular order is giving up what we really wanted here. The whole goal here is to have things that might execute at different times, but be able to provide mutual exclusion. So this is an abstract, simplified problem, but it's meant to model lots of things that you need to do in real computing systems. And we talked about a few examples last class where if you're updating some part of memory or updating your file system, you need to know that during the time when you're doing that update, something else isn't changing. But you certainly would not want to sequentialize that and say user 1 always gets to do their updates before user 2. User 2 might have to wait an awfully long time. So this is the added requirement, the way Dijkstra stated it, that prevents solutions like that. Let's look at another attempted solution. And this is, I think, the most natural obvious solution that, that people would start thinking about. We're going to have some part of that shared memory that we'll use as a lock, and it's got a value true or false. And let's assume it starts with the value false. And what our code is going to do is going to check the lock. If the lock is true, it means some other thread has a lock, and we're going to not enter the critical section. So we'll keep waiting if the lock is true. But if it's false, well, then we're going to make it true to tell the other threads they can't enter that critical section. And then this thread will enter its critical section. And when it's done, it will make the lock false. During the time it enters the critical section, it holds lock. It set it to true. No other thread should be able to enter the critical section. So this, this seems like a nice, simple solution. Is this correct? 
So does this provide the necessary safety property? Does it guarantee that no more than one thread can ever be in the cradle section? Good, yeah. So it does not provide the guarantee we need. And the way to see that is to look at a thread interleave that would allow it to enter. Here's what we could do. So this is thread one. It's going to read instruction one. And at this time, the lock is still false. So it will enter instruction two. And we'll do the lock equals true. But remember, the requirement we have is we can't make any assumptions about the speed of the threads or how instructions are interleaved. So between instruction one and instruction two, any other thread could execute any number of instructions. What thread two would do, so this is thread two, it's going to read the lock. Dexter does assume there's an ordering here, which is in some sense a pretty strong assumption. But thread two's reading of the lock has to happen either before or after this one. But it could happen before two sets the lock. So let's assume it happens here. And then two is going to set the lock. But as long as these two happen, these first instructions happen in both threads before the second instruction happens, then they're both going to see the lock being false. They're both going to enter the critical section. If that can happen, we don't have mutual exclusion. Two threads accessing the critical section at the same time, which is the property we need to prevent. So this solution doesn't work. So one way of looking at the problem here is that the value of lock equals true, both of them are setting it to the same thing. So they can't tell which one actually set it. So if those things happen in different orders, they both could think they have the lock. So instead of making lock just a Boolean, let's make lock a number. We'll use zero to mean no thread has the lock, and the number of the thread to mean thread i has the lock. So if the lock is one, that means thread one has it. The idea here is you're going to check if the lock is zero. If the lock is zero, instead of just setting it to true, you're going to set it to your thread identity. And then to make sure that no other thread set the lock in between, you're going to check that it does have your identity before you enter the critical section. And then when you're done, you set it back to zero so another thread can have a chance to get it. Does this seem better than the last solution? The interleaving that we had in the last solution, would this prevent that particular problem? This is thread one. It's going to do, it's going to check the lock is zero. It's going to set the lock to one. And then it's going to check if the lock is one. And then if it is, it's going to enter the critical, we'll enter the critical section. And what thread two would do is it's also checking if the lock is zero, but it would set it to two. So now the question is, is there any way to interleave those instruction sequences such that both thread one and thread two would enter the critical section at the same time? OK, so what's the order these are executing in that causes the problem? So we're going to do this one first. Thread one doing is lock equals 0, is, and then we're going to do thread two is lock equals 0. OK, so both of those are going to be true. What instruction is going to execute next? OK, two and three for thread one. So, so that's going to be true. And so thread one could enter the critical section. Can thread two enter the critical section? Yeah, this is entering the critical section. Thread 2 could do this instruction next. It's fine, right? It ran this code. It checked lock was 0. Now it's going to set lock as 2, and it's going to check lock as 2. And it's going to enter the critical section. So this doesn't help. Right? The problem is the interleaving here, both of these instructions can happen after this one. And as long as that's the case, this test only helps if the interleaving is here, but it could be between those two. So this fix doesn't work. Seems like sort of a good idea. Not enough. And we could try another step. Let's add an extra lock. This is going to block some of these interleavings. So now we're going to have two locks. You first check lock one and set lock one. Then you check lock two and set lock two. And then you enter your critical section. Could bad things still happen? So we need to look for an interleaving. The interleavings show you a counterexample, right? So our goal is ultimately to prove that bad things cannot happen. So finding interleaving instructions that make something bad happen proves that it's definitely not a good solution. If we can't find one, it doesn't prove that it is a good solution. To prove that there's no bad interleaving, we either need to exhaustively try all possible interleavings, and there are tools that do that, or we need to reason logically that there's no interleaving that could be bad. So in this case, there are bad interleavings. And the bad interleavings would have both threads doing this one, then the same kind of issue with this. So thread one would do this, thread two would do it after the same 
interleaving between the threads there. This doesn't fix the solution. It just makes it harder to see where it's broken. And certainly adding another lock is also not going to help. Right, so you can go down these paths of finding one interleaving that's broken, doing some little tweak to make that not work. It's not going to lead to a good solution.